And the webinar is being recorded. Okay. So right now it's the four of us and there's no attendees. So. Okay. I'll start with that statement. Pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general law, I don't know, 30A, section 20, this meeting of the Amherst Board of Health will be conducted via remote participation to the greatest extent possible. For information on remote participation, please see the calendar entry on the Town of Amherst website. There you will find the Zoom link and the telephone dial-in instructions. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that pu the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. In the event that we are unable to do so, despite best efforts, we will post on the town's website an audio recording of the meeting and meeting minutes will be posted on the Amherst Board of Health website transcript as soon as possible after the meeting. So we have to take attendance. Um, Tim? Here. Lauren? Here. Maureen? Here. All right, Nancy Gilbert is absent and one position is vacant so our first uh, item on the agenda is to review the minutes of the october 13th 2022 meeting does anyone have any comments on the uh, those minutes I would say I didn't see, I thought they were fine. Um, any other thoughts about them? No, is that not? Then maybe we can have a motion to accept the minutes of the meeting. Can't hear you, Tim. Can't hear. So there was some uh, yellow highlight in that one. I don't know if that is. Uh, in the old business B part, there was a, someone is highlighted. I, I'm not sure if it is intended to any corrections or do you see I, that? Uh, or, I, I didn't I, see that. You know, okay. thank you, Tim. I'll review that. I believe that was added by Nancy Gilbert. Okay. Those were, yeah, that's what I believe that is. Which section was it? I thought it was, I'm sorry, was, I don't have them. Yeah. So it was under the old business uh, section B. Okay. On oh, community no, assessment. There was a highlight key informant interviews. I don't know what it, the highlight is for. I don't either. Well, in general, it reads good. I yeah, think I think it's... One, so. I, I can make a motion to accept the minutes uh, for October 13th. And I'll second that. Um, Lauren, can you hear us? Yes. Okay, do you accept both to accept the minutes? Yes. 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 And Tim? Yes. And Maureen, I will also. So the minutes are accepted. This next section is for public comment on agenda topics only. Additional public comment at the end of the meeting for all public health topics. Do we have any? We do. We have someone, and um, I'm going to allow them to talk. It's I see a phone number, and if you can state your name, where you live, and I believe it's three minutes to talk. Maureen, is that right? Yes. And, yeah, okay. All right. So. If you can unmute yourself and please state your name and your address, 413-218. Hi there, can you guys hear me? Yes. 
Hello. Hi, thank you. Um, so my name is Maria Kikiki. I'm in South Hammer. What's your What's your last I, name? Um, Maria. Maria. What's your last okay. name? I'm sorry. Maybe Lauren should mute. I think there's okay. sounds coming. Pardon? My, my last name is Kopicki, K-O-P-I-C-K-I. -I. Okay, thank you. No problem. So um, I wanted to thank you for taking up the toxic chemical regulation. Um, and you are probably aware that this is uh, particularly timely and relevant in terms of addressing the issue of PFAS. Um, and I uh, want you to know that I support the uh, the regulations that you have uh, the draft indicate that they should be avoided whenever possible. Um, uh, I'll comment again later at the at the other public comment portion. Um, but just to to let you know that this is a very timely issue because the issue of artificial turf um, is has been raised um, in with respect to the track and field at the high school. Um, the project that uh, they're looking at there. Um, and I'm really glad that the Board of Health is taking a look at this. There was some indication, um, I think it was uh, uh, in uh, the town manager was saying that, uh, it, that the Board of Health may not be taking this up, but my understanding is that you will be talking about um, artificial turf from a uh, public health perspective. And I really applaud you for doing that. It's a, it's a very important issue. Uh, and I'll speak more to that again later. So thank you for doing this. Okay, thank you. Is that our only comment at this time? That's, yep, yeah, that's the only comment for now. Okay, so our next topic, we're a little ahead of schedule, but it's um, toxic chemical regulation with a slight draft update from Jennifer. Yeah. So um, I wanted to, again, thank Tim and Lauren for submitting this draft. And the draft that you both submitted um, is up on the Amherst um, Board of Health webpage. You can get that draft. What I did was I did review it. I thought some of the research was outstanding. I think you just, you know, I went into databases. You picked really good articles. Um, I see that you looked at some other towns. I think that's really important. There might be some tweaking, um, but what I did was I sent this draft to Jeremiah LaPlante. So now Jeremiah LaPlante, he's the head of facilities and maintenance is gonna look at it and we'll get it back for December and I'll get it back ahead and, and give it back to um, the board members. So I wanted him to look at certain sections. So not the purpose or the definitions, but the regulation and that's section three. Um, he may have some ideas about um, if we use um, the word toxic um, when choosing consumer products or are we looking at green seal requirements, green seal requirements. Um, and he's going to look about look at um, creating um, connecting um, throughout all the buildings the same products. I've also asked him to look at section four um, and section four a. And I know I said um, last month that that four a I'm very interested in to see what his input is. Um, who will be giving the variance? Does that come from the health department? Um, or does it come from another uh, department that might have more expertise? So anyhow, it's still in draft form. Thank you everyone for your patience with me. I really appreciate all the work you've done and we'll revisit this in December. Thank you. Can I add one request? I think yes. Um, beyond the facilities, uh, if, it's, if it could be shared with the fire department. Yes. Um, that will be very helpful because uh, many of the uh, forms used in fire control also, is also something you know uh, they have to look you know they can look for alternatives. Yeah, thank you, Tim. I know you said that to me before, and I I heard you, and I always appreciate being told this, um, you know, a second time. I think starting with Jeremiah, and then we'll really distribute it out. Um, and make sure everyone knows it exists and um, get other input. Um, but yes, definitely the fire, fire department. 
just to clarify the variance procedure. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, it can come back to the board to decide on some of the variances um, okay. based on what type of health effects mm -hmm. and considerations. So that that is something okay. it could come back. You know. No, that's good to know. I appreciate that because when I look at this, and and you know everything will unfold, but you know I look at these consumer products. So what are we oh. using? Um, down in in the clinic, you know, one chemical or this, but when it comes to larger sweeping, um, you know, chemicals, uh, big categories, not just a product. I think that's yeah. very good to know. Thank you. Well set. Yes, um, that's it. For old business, then for moving to new business. Um, there's tobacco violation, 96 North Pleasant Street. Yeah, so I'm gonna report on that. I spoke to Susan Malone, who's our inspector. Um, we have a business um, that was, um, had their cigar smoking tobacco retailers license suspended for 30 days. So that's quite significant. It was through the Department of Revenue and the tax division. So what that means was um, that one of their products or many or other products, but I mean, I'll explain, did not have a tax stamp. So I actually called the manager and spoke with her and I said, can you just explain to me what happened? Is there anything from our point of view that we can help you with, you know, so this doesn't happen again? It was really good to speak with her. She said it was one item and granted this one item had a several um, uh, uh, boxes, but it was one item of tobacco and it didn't have a state stamp. And she said, believe me, if we had known um, it, it should have had a stamp, we would have done it and gotten it up. So we wouldn't have had the suspension. They try to be very transparent. And um, she said that um, it can be challenging to be a retailer. So we had a good, good conversation, you know, um, she certainly doesn't want to see this happen again. And I'd like to be able to support people if they have any questions about tobacco products. Their suspension is November 3rd to December 3rd um, and December 4th, they'll be good to go again. The state, not the state, but our Pioneer Valley Tobacco Coalition will be, do, be doing a reinspection on that. I was just gonna check. So that's it. Did they that come up in an inspection from the from the Pioneer Valley? Portion. Yes, yeah, so that's how it was found. They come into Amherst and uh, do checks throughout all the, the retailers, and that's what they found. To say we've been pretty, we've had very few um, suspensions and, and fines here in Amherst. Um, it is something I wanna continue to look at. Um, tobacco handler quiz was something that I was tasked with, I think about a year ago. Um, and some things have changed since then. There's some great online forms that can be done. Um, there is a checklist for retailers when they come to um, uh, renew their, um, their license, they have to um, go through some steps. So it's a good trigger for them to see what they need to do. So, um, but I am gonna revisit that. I think there's some other questions about tobacco um, that I'd be interested in looking at. Um, and that's that's it for this violation. Um, okay, the next item um, is a WSPC white paper draft. And um, at this point, we thank Tim for making some comments about that, but would like to hear from him if he can explain them a little bit <laughs> to the rest of us. <laughs> All right. Um, so I reviewed the uh, document which was submitted from the Water Supply uh, Protection Committee uh, on large scale solar installations. Um, in general, it's a well written and documented with a lot of background information um, and what they recommend in terms of sound. Uh, they're very sound in terms of uh, uh, extending beyond what they are the these types of installations are expected to do uh, which are controlled under the uh, source water protection uh, planning 
Um, the, in general, the direct health effects are, are not um, direct, but, but you know, direct uh, are not enumerable, but primarily they are through the water quality, potential water quality impacts coming from construction and any type of impacts due to extreme storm events, um, where there is intense storm events, there might be concentration of pollutants. But said that, um, the general uh, recommendations were, uh, done by WSPC is really um, appreciated because they have gone beyond what is um, expected uh, in those types of uh, installations. But one thing is um, the report also mentions a couple of uh, violations or at least um, uh, uh, some sediment erosion and uh, sediment water quality impacts in two cases. And that's only because most of the time the inspection is done during the installation and, and then during the lifespan of the project, we don't do much in terms of follow-ups. So that is something I, I made a recommendation that monitoring and reporting any issues throughout the lifespan, um, especially when there is any type of a um, high erosion formation or high intense runoff coming from the site, it is uh, uh, the operators have to report to the both the w, WSPC, which is the Water Supply uh, uh, Planning Plan Protection Committee, as well as the Board of Health. And it's very important to know that, you know, and, and the other one was um, um, during the inspection stage uh, and until vegetation establishment, of course, it's a really important for, for any type of inspections to make sure the installation and establishment of vegetation is important. But once the that period of its establishment um, uh, stops, or at least you know it's ending, inspection is very infrequent. Um, so what I was suggesting is to have long-term monitoring of these sites, uh, especially when to avoid any implications uh, or impacts, like the two cases we saw in in, in Massachusetts. And I think that will that that is a really uh, important one. Uh, especially when when the um, when the um, the that particular manager of that particular site uh, observes certain uh, impacts, especially heavy amount of runoff going on or any type of a soil erosion uh, coming off the site and uh, or any type of a impacts they could visibly see, it becomes important that they should notify the. Uh, the water, water Supply Protection Committee as well as the Board of Health. The second one, um, I was making a recommendation that could be added is the runoff best management practices. I called it as BMPs in the, uh, in the recommendations. Um, should be a part of any solar bylaw which is, uh, which is being developed. Uh, so these uh, best management practices can be uh, establishing some sort of a uh, uh, buffer strips or um, or some rain gardens or pollinator gardens, all becoming a part of uh, the site installation because th those are the ones which will actually can mitigate uh, heavy runoff uh, that can come up. Uh, so there is one um, comment I want to add, which is more technical. Uh, but it might be a simple uh, uh, misinterpretation, I would say. So when a forest is cleared to inst install, many times we see um, change in water yield. Water yield is some sort of a runoff coming out of the site. But um, I think the report mentioned something about increasing groundwater recharge. I, I think they are primarily talking about water yield, I think. so. So that's the only thing I, um, uh, essentially it won't, um, uh, by converting from forest to a, a solar site, you know, it essentially will not increase infiltration. Uh, essentially will runoff will increase. So that's the only comment, very technical comment I, I, I want to add to that. 
So that's that's my recommendations uh, from the Board of Health point of view. Tim, thank you so much. You know, I read this draft of the white paper by the WSPC. I looked it up online um, at the Conservation Commission. And I learned so much from it. It's not my expertise. I've never read anything about this, you know, too much in depth, but I learned so much from this paper. It's so well organized. It, you know, talked about those two other Massachusetts sites where the developers were fined. Um, and then just how this really differs from other building construction because of the land involved. And sometimes, it, mostly, it's, they try to do it on sloped land for the solar gain. So anyhow, I recommend it to people if they're interested. They can learn a lot. How, how does the solar installation compare to, say, a paving? You know, because I some someone somewhere mentioned impermeable uh areas and it seems to me that this isn't the same as an impermeable area it's but it's maybe a place where water gets dumped into a, a row or something in front of the slant of the the solar panels which is really not a very natural way to uh get rain to flow um so i i just wonder how those things compare so um that's a good question. I was the one who added the, in my comments to add runoff BMPs. And one of them is uh, the since the panels do not infiltrate, they are just essentially right. washing off and uh, concentrating your flows. Um, it can actually uh, increase the velocity because of the runoff. Mm -hmm. But one thing is there is a difference between regular impervious cover, like rooftops, parking lots. Um, uh, sidewalks, everything, um, compared to uh, those which are actually not connected to the storm water lines. Mm -hmm. So it's called as a effective impervious cover. So, mm -hmm. so there's a, some sort of a difference between impervious co cover themselves, like rooftops, which are connected to a gutter, can contribute mm -hmm. to the, you know the storm water flows. But those which are not connected to the gutter, they're just dropping into a lawn area, they have the chance to infiltrate. Mm -hmm. They don't have the same amount of impact uh, like a, a, a influencing the storm water flow. So your solar installations have like a series. It's like a, we could say these are all impervious uh, mosaic, which are mm -hmm. actually concentrating, but they're actually dropping into a lawn area or the vegetated area down down uh, down it allows some sort of infiltration and so that is where i think the water has to be captured uh, allowed more infiltration instead of, you know if the water is not allowed to stay there for a little time which doesn't allow any time time for infiltrate mm -hmm. that could be a problem that means mm -hmm. it will be starting to wash off and create soil erosion and everything so that's the idea behind uh, urban best management practices Mm -hmm. also a part of the solar bylaw. Thank you. You know, also, I don't know if this is the same thing, but like if you go to page eight of the the the, the draft, there's something about what you were talking about. And there's there's drips, there's the sunny drip edge, and then there's the shady drip edge. And it's just how that impacts the it, it being permeable into the, the shaded area of the grass. But anyhow, I, I don't, know if that's accurate but it's there's so much in that paper it was really yeah weird. drip areas can be there but i think the practices should be um not just having those vegetated maintained vegetation maintained below the panels whether it's shaded or non-shaded but uh, when it's starting to collect downstream mm -hmm. there'll be gotcha. large volume of water and that's where i think that should be uh, retention basins or detention basins or even small rain gardens if we can, we do that in any type of development. If any type of a new developers come in, I think that's one of the part of that plan. They have to mm. actually handle the storm water, mm. and and that is that's what has to be replicated in 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 these types of large installations gotcha. too. Gotcha. Boy, I saw photographs of what happened, what went wrong in Williamsburg. I think that's what I saw. It was so yeah. dramatic. Yeah. Mm 
any other comments about that report? Okay. So um, we'll move along to the director's update. Okay. Um, so to give the COVID update, I'm gonna sound pretty similar to what I've been talking about the past few months. Um, the Amherst Health Department continues to collect data every day, Monday through Friday and posting it. Um, we were going to go to weekly, but we collect it daily anyway, and we have a few residents that have been um, asking that we continue, if we can, with the daily raw counts. I think they're making some good graphs, but we know that our numbers aren't um, aren't capturing the real burden of, of COVID um, because of PCR testing down and people not reporting antigen tests and asymptomatic and not reporting. We do continue to look at the incidence rate. I've always been a fan of the 14 day incidence rate that looks at the number of new cases um, per 100,000. And we are low, we're 6.7 and just even two weeks ago, we're 10.4. If you look at our numbers against our wastewater, and I always want to say thank you for the Department of Public Works who collects that three times a week, sends it off to Jamaica Plain and Biobot analyzes it. We get the reports, sometimes it's delayed, um, but we get them and we post them online, we post them outside our door. And it's really wonderful to look at the trend and it truly is low. It's the effluent of three, um, different areas of AMR. So it's all combined, north, um, uh, central, and south, but it combines all the universities and colleges. So it looks at Amherst as a whole. Um, when I think about um, giving um, guidance, I think we should start talking about how we give guidance for COVID and also RSV and flu. So RSV is respiratory syncytial virus. Um, seeing these real, what they're calling unprecedented spikes. Um, the Boston Globe is reporting Mass General's ICU, for example, is above 150% um, above capacity for RSV. I hope all of your children are, are nice and healthy and I think it is going around the schools. Um, we also wanna look at flu. Um, so influenza, um, this, the Department of Public Health starts um, recording that on week 40. So that was um, October. If you go to um, Massachusetts D DPH um, influenza weekly reports, you can see that they now have an interactive flu dashboard. So they've really done some, some uh, upgrading to that. And you can see where we are. Um, I don't have it in front of me, um, but the first two weeks, um, we started higher than we were in the last five years. So flu mm -hmm. influenza like illnesses, ILCs are up. Um, so I don't, you know, just everyone has to think of all these things. So COVID precautions and now the flu and RSV. So I think what I've been saying is just going to hold true what we read in the New York Times, what we read in our research papers um, about protecting the vulnerable. I think that needs to be a key thing and thinking about breaking the chain of transmission. Um, I love those two sayings now. Um, so things that we can consider um, is having a plan, um, finding out ahead of time about events and precautions, um, figure out who's going to be the highest risk person at the event and bring the, the guidance up to that level. Um, for example, Thanksgiving's coming up, other holidays are coming up. Can you really have everyone at a, a tight table or can you spread people out? Can you have really good ventilation? And also importantly, we have a lot of antigen tests we wanna give out to you. Um, they're here, you can call us, but have everyone do sequential testing, test two days out then test the day of. If you're negative, pretty much you can assume that you're not transmitting the disease. Um, the other thing is have a backup plan. Um, make sure that, um, you know, if you feel like you're going into a situation that is more risk, use a different mask. Maybe you even exit um, and come back another time. 
Um, the other thing is have a good provider. If you don't have a um, health care provider, if you don't have health insurance, please call the health department here. We can help you get set up with that. Not us, but we can refer you to people. Um, I know when I call my provider, it's hard to get them, but I've gotten really good at the portal. And if you use the portal, they get back to you within hours. <clears throat> so that sort of transitions into a new um, research paper that's been out since the 5th. I don't know if it's a preprint or not, but it's one of the first studies that say Paxlovid um, may be helping reduce the risk of long-term COVID. So I think that's something for us all to think about is Paxlovid. Um, take it if you qualify. It reduces, um, minimizes your severity of illness, but it can help in long COVID. Um, some of the things that I hear in um, the uh, COVID clinics that we are giving is that they are still, um, people are getting vaccinated. We're at 90% for fully vaccinated here in Amherst. Um, I'm so ha happy about that. But some people are still thinking that <clears throat> getting the vaccine prevents you from catching the disease. So just a reminder that the vaccine reduces severity and it keeps you from uh, more, you know, reducing mortality risks from death, um, but it doesn't necessarily prevent you from catching the vaccine. So that's going to be part of the transmissibility of the, um, the different variants we have, but also it's more behavior. So, um, so think about what you can do to prevent that. Um, right tool at the right time, wear your mask, um, like a regular procedure mask when you think you might need it, a KN95 for more dense uh, situations, more crowded, poor ventilated rooms. Um, ventilations, like I said, are key. Um, now to say um, with the RSV and flu, wash your hands, continue to wash your hands, use time and friction, don't touch your face. I think people have gotten pretty good about not touching their face. And stay home when you're sick and then get boosted this fall. So right now we're doing um, bivalent booster um, clinics every Thursday, 12 to two. But I have a sort of news that I'm very excited about that we're gonna be having a large COVID vaccine clinic December 5th, that's a Monday from two to six here in the Amherst um, Bangs Community Center. And the state is coming in to help us. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be offering vaccines from six months old and older. So everybody, we're going to have the Pfizer first and second doses, bivalent. We're going to have Moderna. And we're going to have J&J. &J. And because the state is sponsoring this, a $75 gift card for everybody that gets vaccinated. Sure. Um, so I know I'm so happy about this. So I asked them what the gift card was for. They said at one point it was for a grocery store, but they're not quite sure what people will, the, the company will show up with. Um, but it's not retroactive, unfortunately. It's just for people that are getting vaccinated at this clinic. Right now, if you want to sign up for this clinic, you can go to the Amherst Health Department um, and up on the web page, Lillian has put um, a big COVID clinic um, uh, thumbnail. If you click on it, you can sign up right now. But then this coming Monday, we're going to start with a lot of social media and just go to apartment complexes, the schools, and just let everybody know about this. How many um, appointments will there be for this day, do you think? Um, under uh, 600, they have to keep it under 600. So okay. um, That's when a we get number, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm so happy about this. It's the time just to, to come in, get your bivalent booster two months after your last shot, even if it was a regular booster um, and get that immunity going before the holidays. So you still need two weeks for that to start. Okay. Can, can you explain what the bivalent is? Is that a combination? Yeah. yeah, thanks, Lauren. You know, there's so many different names and terminology. Um, so this is the new booster. So thank you for clarifying that. Um, it covers the Omicron BA.5 and BA.4. Um, so and some of the ancestral strains, so the original strain. So when you get this shot, it has broader protection, um, the antigen more 
you know, diverse antigens and more uh, greater antibodies, the breadth of that. So it has the Omicron strain. Thank you. That's the COVID update. And I would just put in a plug that don't forget your flu shots. Those oh. are important too. Of those we don't have, I don't think, at the health department or no, I don't know. Yeah, thank you, but Maureen. Your pharmacies and uh, uh, other, uh, I guess those are the main sources. Your primary care doctor's offices are the place to go because it's a good match for this particular flu outbreak. Mm. And this flu outbreak started earlier and it's it's going faster. You know, there are just more more cases at, at this point in the year than it's quite unusual. Um, so this is definitely the time if you haven't gotten your vac flu vaccine to get out there and get it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. You know, I have to say um, the Amherst Health Department, we get flu vaccine from the state. And the vaccine, because we're a local board of health, we're able to give it to uninsured people only. So we've been okay. doing some flu vaccines um, clinics. Um, we're at Craig Stores um, uh, Tuesday night, Olivia, Lara Cahoon, the new um, public health nurse. But okay. I think we're, oh, yeah, Excellent. I think, yeah, yeah, thank you. It's a real honor. Um, I think next year we're going to get back into the flu business, but that, that means we'll have to purchase flu and then we may have to charge and we can do that and it's not a charge to the person be the insurance company but that way maybe we can have a revolving fund but I just think now is the time to start thinking about how we can maybe the health department can up our game with that mm -hmm. thank you okay thank you um and then I can go into the health department updates is that okay? I, I have a part two mm -hmm. of director's update. Sure. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, we are continuing our childhood immunization clinics. We're very happy about that. Um, we've been doing a few families that have been coming in, um, giving them polio, um, you have Tdap or Dtap. Um, we have the childhood immunizations. Um, and I'll, I've always say this, that it's one part vaccine and nine, nine parts education or support. Um, so our health department right now, I can look down on the Musanti Health Center. So we'll give a shot. Then we give them a packet and we say, you know, Deanna Solaire's down there and she's down there for two hours. Let's walk you down, get you some health insurance and get you set up. So I love this program. And then the other last thing I have is for folks to know that there is a new amended housing code coming out. Um, it's going to go into effect April 2023. Um, our health inspectors, um, restaurant and building are going to training. I'm actually going to do some of the training myself. So I think that's a big, big deal. I don't know when the last time they were updated, but I'll let you know as we get closer, if there's anything that impacts us. It's 105 CMR 410. Um, one thing I know that it is going to affect is um, they're revising the heating season. It used to be September 15th through May 31st, and this is something that used to come up in the Clark House. Um, so now it's going to be, um, it used to be September to June, excuse me, and now it's going to be September 15th through May, but it also is, um, this aligns more with like, I think the weather patterns, but also the Board of Health can also make some amendments. Um, there's some other things that are going on um, with the housing code, but I'll keep you updated as that happens. And that's, that's what I have. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> um... So now do we go to public comment? Mm -hmm. So are there additional, is there additional public comment? I see no hands up. Oh, there's a hand. Okay. So I see Maria Kopicki, if I'm saying it correct, if you can say your name again and thank you. Unmute yourself. Yeah. Hello again. So um, just a quick introduction. Um, I'm a retired OBGYN and um, 
And also more recently, I uh, worked as a case investigator and an outbreak specialist uh, with COVID. And so I really appreciate you guys staying on top of things. Um, thank you for that. I, I wanted to speak tonight uh, about my concerns about uh, artificial turf. Um, there is a proposal to uh, use artificial turf at the high school track and field, the field part. Um, and this was voted on earlier this year. Um, and PFAS has been in artificial turf is a known thing now. Uh, it hasn't gotten a lot of um, uh, press and uh, maybe locally, but, but it, it, regionally it has. In fact, Boston has uh, recently made the papers and talking about not allowing any artificial turf in any fields that they're going to be uh, installing um, because of PFAS. Um, and uh, when this was voted on initially by the school committee, there literally was not any discussion. PFAS was not mentioned at all uh, during any of those school committee meetings nor the CPAC meeting um, when funding was obtained. But um, it was recently brought uh, to the attention of the school committee. Um, and uh, brought to the attention of town council who was uh, asked to authorize some funding and several town councilors asked that the board of health uh, dig into this and, um, and make recommendations. So my concern is um, about PFAS, this is uh, avoidable. A natural turf field, the grass field can be used and would have all the improvements that would uh, prevent, uh, uh, that would help with all of the problems of the, the current field, the poor drainage, and uh, it, it, either way it would need to be maintained. Uh, artificial turf, you probably, or you may be aware of some other concerns aside from PFAS, uh, depending on what kind of infill is used, it can have um, uh, uh, organic carbons in there and, and lead and, um, and the PFAS is in the blades and the backing. And even though some uh, uh, firms that talk about using it, and including the one that the, the school committee has used, Weston and Sampson, may say that there's no PFAS um, in the product, there is. And, um, and that got to be an issue in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. There's a lot of evidence on this. Uh, other concerns are the heat injuries and the orthopedic and skin injuries um, that you see in artificial turf that you do not see um, in a natural grass field. So we have an alternative. So when feasible to avoid PFAS, this is one of those times when it is feasible um, and to get still get those benefits to, uh, to the people who are gonna be using the field. And by the way, I'm also, um, a, a big sports enthusiast, both myself and for um, for my kids. So I am absolutely in full full fledged support for improving these fields, but not with artificial turf. So I hope that um, you will take this up. The town council is is uh, got this on their agenda for the 21st, but it, that can be. Uh, delayed again, and I really do think that the public health and environmental issues need to be addressed for personal safety, um, but also for water bodies um, and, and environmental uh, concerns, so all important public health concerns. Uh, thank you that, very much. I hope I didn't go over three minutes. No, you're good. Thank you. Other commenters? That was the one person, yeah. Okay. Um, so now we move to topics not anticipated by the chair 48 hours prior to the meeting. And one of those, um, that issue is actually this concern about the artificial turf and whether, um, it, and asking that the Board of Health actually weigh in on, on that question because of concerns about PFAS. Um, this is a complex issue. Um, they, it's a difficult time to be making decisions about it. And from what I can read, there is con there are concerns that have been reported in different communities. Um, but there's not a great deal of, of wide, broad scale research on that. M from my reading, again, I'm, I am not a two-week expert on these artificial turf fields. I've been looking at the 
some of the literature and the reports from the, there's an EPA uh, CDC study that's in process, but most of those studies actually didn't focus on PFAS. It was more about the issue of the, uh, not the blades of grass, so the fake blades of grass or what have the PFAS and the, and the, and the, uh, the, 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 whatever holds them together, but there's a crumb rubber that it fills in and, and helps the, the blades of grass to stand up and to soften the field. Crumb rubber is uh, basically ground up uh, tires. And so there have been all a long-term concerns about, about the uh, contact with them, that, either from the air or skin contact or ingestion. And it hasn't really been clear what's going on with that. And there, there's a big study that, that was started uh, like around 2017 that kind of defined some of those chemicals, but haven't that didn't proceed with the with the exposure because of the pandemic kind of slowed down a lot of things with, with that study. Again, it <clears throat> the it hasn't it really hasn't, there's nothing on that scale even in process about PFAS. So it's a difficult time to be making a long-term decision. Um, anyway, um, we just heard about this again, I think yesterday, is it coming, we request that it can come before the board. Um, our chair woman is in Ecuador and we would like a chance to um, take this seriously and perhaps discuss this at our next meeting. So I think that's our hope that, that we can pro postpone some of those decisions um, until just a little bit later in this year. Lauren? Can I, yes, I have a few thoughts. <laughs> it's it's difficult trying to keep track of all the things that are going on in the town. Um, but from my vague recollection, um, the town council, I believe, voted on going forward with the turf. And I'm not remembering if it was which cost less. Was it the natural um, field or, or bringing in the turf, but I know the, the cost was the issue. And then also recently a counselor got sent a, a um, article about the concern of injuries of the high risk of injuries. So I, again, for me as, um, a board member for, for the Board of Health, I first, you know, want to understand what the council is doing. And I don't quite know what the Board of Health, yay or nay, how they would influence or impact the decision of the council because from my recollection I, I feel like they've already agreed on the turf and now there's still more information coming in so I, I'm not sure if they're going to vote again but those are some things that are just thoughts in my mind. I'm not clear on that either um I asked Jennifer and she hadn't had a direct um, request from the town council for the Board of Health to consider this question, but it has come up from community members that the Board of Health consider this question. And, um, and if I can just say, I have spoken to Paul Bachelman about it, mm -hmm. but you're, you're correct, yeah. But Paul and I have been talking, okay. just keeping up to date. Yeah. Um, and, um, and I think, you know, I, I remember reading about the field and there were three options and one of them did have a natural grass field and then the more expensive one had the turf field. And I think there are concerns about PFAS and, and in leaching into water and maybe some direct exposure to people, but more probably leaching out. And 
Um, the other thing is these turf fields, if I look it up don't last that long they last eight to ten years and then they have to be you know maybe a little longer than that but then they have to be up replaced so then what do you you know so we, there's this can't be recycled uh you know so it has to be disposed of in some way so there are a lot of concerns at every kind of different steps along the way about about these turf fields that are getting more attention now in the last couple of years um, and like Maria had said that Boston has, has put a ban on any future artificial turf fields. Um, I don't, I don't, I mean, I, you know, I think we're here to talk about the health effects and what's safer and the council figures out and the school figure out the, what's more expensive, but I, so I don't I don't know that uh, that information. I think there's upkeep that's significant for both types of fields. I would you know my first impression was these turf fields you just put them there and forget it, but they also require upkeep annual. You know, so it's not exactly uh, you know you set it and forget it kind of uh, kind of a system. Um, so again. <laughs> this came up to us just just yesterday and um i think we need more time to think about it and get more information thanks lauren yeah i, I have a suggestion um uh, because I, I feel that we run into a lot of times like trying to visualize um these complex issues and you know, it does matter when you have the right information and where you're getting the, you know, your information from and are you able to go out and actually see, you know, in real life, like what is what is happening um, to collect information as well. So would it be possible to have a member, you know, contact you know either a, like I don't know how it works but it, is there like a, a contact counselor that you know has already gotten some information or researched this that can like help inform us as to how we would you know lead a discussion or you know try to you know put information together is like how 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 are we connecting to the the researchers that have already researched this and the, the town leaders that have already you know put forward their their interests or you know how they feel i don't know jennifer are you any thoughts yeah i think um lauren i think you have some good ideas um a lot of research has been done already so it's like what information do where do we get it and how do we gather it and sort of you know take a look at it all so you know i think there's things that we can do you know i still have access to umass and the good databases you know pubmed and sinal which is the nursing allied health and and cochrane they do the meta analysis so that's one area and then looking at um, what have other towns done and and the expert information they've brought in um, do we get experts on both sides? What's the industry saying? So I think it's a process of, of figuring out how to gather all that um, and not recreate the wheel. And um, I would just say, I, you know, when this, when we get to the point of, of researching it, exactly what are we researching? So what is the field that's been proposed? And I, I don't know. So mm -hmm. there's different types of organic infills, for example. I don't, you know what how do they compare there's coconut silk there's walnut there's cork um but that may not in itself be enough but i think it'd be be important for us to know exactly what the thought was that they were mm -hmm. planning on installing um i think uh, in terms of research there's no ambiguity in that and in the sense in the past decades we have so much studies on artificial turf and 
um, there are really good review papers on that, you know, which which covers um, groundwater infiltration and volatile organic compounds. That's essentially those when they when they emit, you know, these volatile compounds. You know, usually these are rubber compounds. You know, and so uh, in, in in terms of uh, research, it's there. But thing is, um, you know, I'm hoping uh, the town council, as well as the, the you know the town manager and the school committee itself, can direct some sort of a advice from us. Um, and because I think this, if you are installing on on schools. What are we exposing our children to? You know, um, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and I think um, these rubber compounds, in terms of over the lifetime, um, they can have some sort of a slow cumulative effect. You know, in terms of concentrations of um, it might be very low PFAS or it might be low in terms of rubber compound during installation, but over the lifespan, I think it could have some sort of a uh, impacting. So water supplies and anything like that. So I, I think um, it'll be, even though the budget has been uh, approved and whatever it is, it will be of interest. I think the school committee probably should look into the environmental impacts mm -hmm. uh, it, it poses. I think if if they decide on that and the town council decides and, send, and seek our advice, I think that's when I think we could... Uh, brainstorm on this one and discuss in during the asset board. So, so I guess for for now, you know, I, I guess the plan might be for Jennifer and then maybe Nancy to kind of explore what's known and um maybe find a way to get some expert opinion mm -hmm. or uh, uh, about about this. Yeah. Um, and we come at this again in our, our next meeting. Um, but I think it is an important issue because it is a long-term, like Tim was saying, they're long-term effects. And I my understanding is that, you know, you can't, it, it's not easy to go backwards from a turf field because once you have that, you know, to try to go back and grow a grass field, I think is really, from what I read, is really not not an easy thing to do. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. it, it seems like a, a commitment to something that that might not be the best for the, the long run. But I I don't really know the answer to that, um, and. I think it's important to, you know, even though things people want things to progress quickly, it's time to it it's the moment to to really look at what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and I also support the athletic fields and upgrading them. And I think it's really important that we have fields that work. Um I, from my kids in sports, I know that has field has been a problem for a long time. My kids are pretty old by this time. So um so in in terms of um environmental impacts I, I think we only focused on infiltrating groundwater impacts and everything but I, i'm sure they talked about other probably turf gas artificial turf gas has other benefits in terms of less mowing that means less amount of emissions mm -hmm. uh, um, and you know uh, and, and those types of you know uh other alternatives in terms of water use you know, there's mm -hmm. less water consumption. That means you don't lose. So, so it it is has to be discussed in the light of what is more long term in terms of sustainability, you know, so, mm -hmm. which can achieve what we wanted um, in terms of sports facilities, but also overall how how we could balance all those uh, economic and societal needs. So, mm -hmm. no. I I know they're like Tim, you know, I found a lot of studies about this whole issue of, of exposure and there's, it seems like it's not very much, but they really haven't 
been able to, they're pretty small studies about the actual exposure issue to, to for health health outcomes. And it's a really hard thing to study because all these fields are a little different and expo- you know, it's hard to quantify exposure. And so the um, European um, Environmental Protection Agency did did make some reg- tighter regulations on what can be in the crumb rubber that's in that infill. Um, but they're, they said they're kind of waiting for these big studies that are supposed to be happening in the United States to kind of fine tune some of those things or get more information. So there, it feels like there's some information, but it's not very conclusive. And right now it seems like that isn't a big problem, but there is this question about do we really know that it isn't a big problem? And and PFAS is, and from the concerns about the grassy parts, that hasn't really been part of uh, these major studies, uh, I don't think. Um, so you know, it'll be something. And I guess that's used in the manufacture of those little skinny green pieces of plastic. Otherwise, they don't extrude from the extruder. So it's it's really kind of built into the process, um, it seems, you know, so I'd be love to be educated more about these, these issues. My, my only question, though, is, have they already decided on the turf? And are, or, or are they walking back? And are they trying to gather more information? Because I'm, I'm still like, not sure where the the town is on this decision or the town council is and so I um I I would just like to when when we have the conversation just kind of know where they are in their decision making Mm -hmm. you know I kind of lost track but Mm -hmm. um, I think that would be important as to what what is being asked of us. Have they already decided on turf? Have they have they died? I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. Well, that'll be part of what we need to find out. So I can do that for next month. You know, when mm-hmm. I spoke to Paul. Then I had reached out to Nancy Gilbert and we knew it couldn't go on to today's agenda, but it was figuring out when it would be next. So so if I hear you you saying that you would like it on the December 8th agenda. Well, we can that, check in with Oh, no, Nancy. no. Yeah. Sorry. I, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yes. We'll wait. I think we can. Yeah, I think we can see where th- we can do some re- footwork, legwork on this and check in with Nancy and see what the what the plan will be i don't thank you to make a decision in i'm sorry that you're very <laughs> yes you're very clear maureen i'm sorry i said that well we'll that's check okay in. We'll see. yeah yep all right and and I, i'm not aware of anything else that's come up um so do we want to have a motion to adjourn the meeting I can make a motion to adjourn. And I can second that. Okay. <laughs> I know you eat but And we need to vote. Lauren? Yes. Tim? Aye. Maureen? Yes. So our meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good job. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, you did, Maureen. I made it through.